welcome everybody. I've got a return guest, JJ Flazanes, who those of you who are here before know that JJ is a vibrant, intelligent, and really interesting source for information that you won't get from me because JJ is very good at looking at people's behaviors and why they behave the way they do, and also the impediments to success, whether they be in relationships or financial or in health. JJ is very good at zeroing in on the causes, these impediments, these things that block your success. So I thought I'd bring JJ back once again to talk about ways to repair emotional healing of the sort that could impair your success and something as basic as a, uh, a diet to lose weight or a diet to restore the microbiome or all the other basic things we do. So welcome back, JJ. Thank you, Dr. Davis. I'm excited about this conversation. Thank you for having me back. Well, judging from past experiences with you, I know that you don't need much prompting to lunge into a very good and exhaustive conversation. So give us your initial thoughts. Let's say somebody does, let's say one of my programs, and they're always sabotaging themselves. Maybe they're, so if they're following a wheat and grain-free diet, for instance, they always manage to somehow nibble some of it at the office or at the, uh, at, at the, at the mall. Or if they're going to do something uh, constructive for the microbiome, they don't follow through with all the steps we know work. They just only do it spottily or inconsistently. What, what, what do you think about those kinds of impediments? Yeah. Uh, let's, if I could just back up for one second and sort of give a mass overview of one of the things that interested you to bring me back was the topic of the roadmap to emotional healing. And I, and I want to do that in this context because what I have been learning through working with the physicians that I work with under the metabolic approach to cancer with Dr. Nisha and with you and other physicians that I've talked to interviewed, they've interviewed me, you know, as I continue on this journey, I get, I fine tune, I fine tune and I get clear and clear about how I do what I do and how I do what I do is in, let's say I'm going to use Dr. Nisha's terrain 10 for a second. She takes 10 different things that they look at. And I'm sure with all the testing that you do, you're looking at multiple things to come up with some kind of diagnosis to create a plan to address what is shown to you in this diagnosis, whatever the test may be, blood work, stool test, GI map testing, whatever. And uh, so it's the same with the emotions. And I have sort of this step-by-step -step process to uncover what is blocking you. And I'm and so I call it the roadmap to emotional healing. I created a course that people can do on their own called the roadmap to emotional healing, but I'm going to, I'll give you sort of the overview of the components in order to diagnose what's going on. And then I'm going to make it real simple. Actually, let me make it real simple. First, the reason why people self-sabotage is because they don't know how to accept more love, joy, success, and abundance. Gay Hendricks wrote a book called the big leap and he calls it upper limits. To me, an upper limit in terms of like I again teaching law of attraction, an upper limit I consider like a temperature gauge. There is a degree or amount or a like everyone has a certain amount of love, success, joy, and abundance they think they deserve subconsciously and allow themselves to have. We all want more than what we allow in. And that's where we kind of go back and forth. When we hit that end point of this is as much joy, success, love, and abundance, and attention on myself that I am willing to receive, then I self-sabotage. And again, it's unconscious until you understand the pattern, until you understand how you upper limit and why you upper limit. All right, so simply, in order for us to expand into allowing more in, which for some people means dedicating more time to themselves, it means treating themselves in a new way. Most people can white knuckle, left brain, control some kind of diet plan for a short amount of time. Whether it becomes a lifestyle or they decide to make it part of what they do is dependent on, again, the amount of love they're willing to give themselves. I mean, that's really the bottom line. It comes down to self-worth and it comes down to what discipline is. Yes, it can be controlling and white knuckling and very left brain, but it's the idea, and I'm not a big like, okay, you have to do, you know, it's rigid and it doesn't have flexibility. But at the same time, we have to allow for ourselves just like how we feel. And it's not about getting to the end goal. For most people that start a diet plan, they do it because they want to love themselves more. Pure and simple. Yes, they're uncomfortable in their bodies. They don't like the way they look. And they come in with that energy into a program like yours and they say, well, I'm going to do this because once I lose weight and once I feel better, then 
I'll love myself. Then I'll be happy. Then I'll be able to go out and date. Then I'll be getting the raise. So it, you put your happiness and you put this, um, you put this in front of you as if it's a carrot, but the problem is the carrot keeps moving and we haven't done the work to allow in the results and the effort and the attention and the focus because most people, it's funny, we were talking before we started recording about you being in Wisconsin and I'm remembering a relationship, though well, maybe it was many years ago when I was in Wisconsin and I was talking to a, a, a girl, she's a couple of years younger than me at the time. And I remember asking her questions, very basic questions about her job, about her, where she lived. And, and after, I don't know how much time it was, it was probably, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. She literally mid-sentence, I was asking questions. She stood up, she walked away from me. And then she turned back to me and she said, JJ, I can't just sit and talk. And I was dumbfounded. I thought, oh my God, what the heck was that about? You know, and, and the person I was with said to me, well, you're so deep and you, you know, you're very intense. And I said, I didn't ask her her astrology or what she believed about God. I asked her very simple, basic questions that any person would be able to answer that it should be no pressure. But what I learned, what I learned in that experience was my eye contact with her, my focus on her, and she's overweight, very overweight. My focus on her made her so uncomfortable being seen, being heard, being paid attention to. She did not have the capacity to receive the amount of attention I was giving her. So she had to leave. And, and so when it comes down to these self-sabotaging behaviors, it really comes back to how much love, success, joy, and abundance we allow ourselves to have. And if we believe we're worth it. And, and when we start out a program like yours or any program where we're trying to love ourselves more or be better when we start. That's why I wrote fit to love. That's why I started my podcast because I kept trying to figure out who am I in this fitness space? <laughs> Cause I really hate most of these things. I hate the focus. I hate the control. I hate the external worry about what you look like as if that is important. I mean, it is, but it's not like, why do we do this? And I wanted to connect. What is my story? Cause I didn't lose a hundred pounds and I'm like, Oh, everybody do this and lose a hundred pounds. I thought, what the heck is my story? And my story was that I, I used self care to love myself, that my, my energy underneath doing it wasn't about, because I would walk into a gym. I'll never forget. And this is about a junior was going to this gym at the time. It was in, it was in Randall Ray and I was training and I would walk in and I would feel the difference between the people on the treadmill. I could feel them hating themselves as they were doing it. And all I could hear was, I hate myself. I hate myself. I, ha I have to do this. I have to do that because I hate myself. I hate myself. I hate myself. It feels bad. And that kind of shaming never gives you results forever. They're not sustainable because then you, you equate this shaming, this punishment of exercise with, right, with not loving yourself. But that was what my whole Fit to Love brand was about. It was like giving to yourself. It was investing in yourself. It was taking care of yourself on a level that feels amazing and good. And because you love yourself, because your self-care routine can be driven by energy of, of hatred and self-detest and waiting to love yourself, which is never going to be sustainable. Or you can learn to love yourself and then do it from that point of view, which will be more sustainable and you will get the results. And it isn't an all or nothing kind of journey. It's you, it does challenge you, but without doing the emotional work, you're going to just bounce around from program to program, waiting for something to click in as if it's about just the food. It's not about just the food because it doesn't matter if it's exercise or food or self-improvement in an area relationships until you uncover what, and so let's go back now to the roadmap. So for me, over the years that I, I started, I don't know if I said this on my last show, but with you that I started my podcast to save my marriage and all the things that I have learned has been because I have been, because I wanted to figure out for me and for him, how to like, what's going on here? Like, why is this happening? And what do I do about it? And, and, and why do I hear things differently than he hears things? And why does he react to things that I don't think are a big deal the way that he reacts? And, and it's not that I wasn't already curious and already doing that to a certain degree, but man, did I take a deeper dive for 10 years to really not master, no one masters, but to get to the point where I feel pretty confident about how I understand and see how all of these things play a role in someone's interpretation, someone's uh, how they feel, how they see the world, what they're looking for. So the roadmap starts with understanding and the diagnosis is your core wounds. 
And I learned this in a therapy session in certain, using certain tools that I wanted to be using. I actually sought somebody out to use these tools. And when I did this exercise, I literally said, oh my God, why isn't every single person in therapy everywhere doing this, starting with this exercise? This shortcuts, I'm telling you, five years off of therapy when you understand coming in what your core wounds are, because it gives you structure. You understand what you're working on. I actually even did a talk called the three reasons why traditional talk therapy is ineffective. And it's a free, it's a free 90 minute video you can watch. It's on my website. But it, and it's because like I had to go, why do people hate therapy? Why do men hate therapy or don't like it? Why do women not seem to get any different? Why are they still the same person after seven years of therapy? Why do they still react the same way? Why, why, why? And so I've just been learning that. And again, this core wound exercise is where we start because until we know what your core wounds are, you don't know what to do about it. <laughs> like you're just throwing stuff at the wall, hoping it sticks. We have to have a diagnosis of the things that you're searching for in life. When you understand what your core wounds are, you can make sense of every relationship, every job you've had, every breakup you've had. It's super clear. And then I've now even made a core wound map. Um, I get better and better every time I do this. Uh, you've made, you get this core wound exercise and you, you break it down into the map. And so you now see, you boil it down to when you get triggered, here are the three core wounds it triggers. And then here's how you feel about it. And here's how you react. And then Anyway, yeah, I can go on. It's just, it's super fun to make sense of and to see a structure and to see clarity around and make sense of. I had a woman come to me. She listened to my show a little bit. I was doing a three-month beta program this year of a, a course that I do, a very deep dive emotional group course, small people, like six people. And I, she said to me, I've spent $200,000 on stuff like this. I've done Dr. Joe Dispenza's workshop, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know why I do this, why I feel this way, why I think this way. And I said, oh, you'll get all that. Oh, yeah. You'll never ask that again. If you take this course with me, you will never. You will know exactly why you feel that way, why that happened, why you reacted that way. What you do about it, I mean, that's just the first step. Then we have to integrate it into your life. So it, it makes the emotional conversation more manageable and more mechanical and not so like, oh, I don't know, I feel this way. Why do I feel this way? You know, and it takes, it it makes this roadmap very individualized for a person who says, now what do I do about it? Okay, here's my diagnosis. Here are my core wounds. I don't, I self-sabotage because I don't think I'm good enough. I felt invisible growing up. So now what do I do about it? And then you can work from there to create a plan of different kinds of things to help you embody and stretch past that place where you upper limit and allow in more, because I'll tell you, even I did it. I mean, we all do it. You, whatever your temperature gauge is now, if you want more than what you have, there will be an upper limit for everybody forever. Whatever next level you're going to, you're going to feel the, the growing pains of self-sabotage. When Dr. Nasha interviewed me for her doctors, and at the same time, I was being interviewed for another Law of Attraction podcast. Both people who have bigger audiences than I do <laughs> that day. Oh, imposter syndrome came right in. Imposter syndrome of, oh my God, who am I? My neck started to creak. My the shoulder hurt. I thought, oh my God, I'm having pains in my body. What's going on? And I was nervous. And then as I started talking and as I started, you know, going through it, I thought, oh no, no, I am the perfect person to do this. No, no, I do have a, I am, I know what I'm talking about, but I was being put out to the world as a non-therapist to a bunch of physicians that this is someone that we recommend you work with emotionally. And that's jumping from that and claiming that and allowing that was super uncomfortable for me, even though intellectually, I know it, but my body was like, whoa, this is scary. So I'm just saying everybody upper limits. When you know what it is, you, you know why you do it and how you do it, you can identify it, then you can find tools to breathe through it and allow more in. And you just know it's happening. You're like, okay, that's what this is. All right, time to allow in more. What does that look like? So I would say people, in order to be successful on any kind of diet or weight loss program, they need to they need to click into and love themselves before they do it, not after, because the after never happens. Well, what does the process look like, JJ, to, to get that process started? Well, it's well, it's using the core wound exercise or doing the roadmap to emotional healing course, which goes through two exercises that I think everybody starts out with. And I'll pull one over right now. We might have talked about this on the last show. And if we did, then it doesn't matter because it's worth repeating. Um, I use an exercise based on the work of Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, nonviolent communication. Terrible title. 
terrible title. Um, <laughs> he has since left the earth. Otherwise, I would tell him it's a terrible title. And I actually at one point wanted to rewrite the book with a better title because and I've taken my spin on it. Right. I've extracted this one exercise because when you learn this, if you just learn this, this is enough for like six months, if you can, and then for the rest of your life. And this is about getting your needs met. And this is about understanding your emotions and what your needs are that create the emotions. So I'll just quickly, um, this exercise is taught in the roadmap course, but I'll, I'll explain it. And if anybody wants to get the free download of this uh, list that comes along with a couple of documents, um, it's jjfilzanes.com forward slash feelings list. It's free. And again, it's this plus another document, but so it's, Negative emotion only happens. Okay, let me say that again. Negative emotion only happens when there's a need not being met or the perception of a need not being met. It might be being met and you just don't know it, which is, but it's again, your perception of it that creates the problem. So you'll never do this exercise when you're happy, <laughs> but the exercise is to be done when you feel negative emotion and you start with step one is identifying the emotion. What is it? And, you know, most people don't have a vocabulary for emotion. They think, oh, I'm happy. I'm sad. I'm mad. I'm like, like, there's not that much there. There's a hundred different feeling words on that list. And the reason why there's a hundred different feeling words is because there's a very dramatic difference energetically between irritated and rage, but they both are under mad, right? They're both under the angry category. But if you're just irritated, then it's a, it's a little intense. If you're at rage, holy cow, look out. So you start with what are the feelings and then you move to, okay, so I recognize that I'm irritated. Why am I irritated? What need is not being met? And then you uncover that with the 86 basic human needs on this list. And they're not needy. You're not dependent. You're not less than. This is literally like, okay, under play, we've got excitement, fun, humor, joy, laughter. Under physical, we have air, hydration, move, rest. Do you know how many people think there's something wrong with them and all they need is a freaking nap? They're so tired and they try to solve the world's problems and they're literally sleep deprived. If you just rested, you'd be clear headed and come back into your body. Right. But most people don't know that they're trying to like, they're on this momentum wheel of trying to figure everything out when their body doesn't have any rest. Like they're like, zzz, they're burning the candle at both ends. Their adrenals are shot. Uh, their nervous system is shot and they're not going to be able to hear or get the download or the information because they're not in a frequency to receive it. So, you know, rest, safety, shelter, touch, safety. Safety is a basic human need. Most people don't relate to until you dive a little deeper under, you know, like a job situation. You know, why people are so anxious at work is because they don't want to lose their job because they need the money to pay their bills. And they have this illusion of feeling secure when you work for someone else, which we all know that is an illusion because that's like you're a sitting duck when you work for somebody else because they could fire you, right? Working for yourself is the best way to go if you if you believe in yourself enough to do it. But but these are just basic needs and we figure out and it's it sounds simple and it is, but it isn't easy because nobody thinks like this. People think, oh, two minutes ago I was happy. Now I'm unhappy. What's changed? You must be your fault. You must be the reason why I'm unhappy. <laughs> and it's not. That person is just a mirror for you to show you. And they tickle an, a wound. They tickle a core wound. And all of a sudden, your brain starts to interpret things and t tells a story that's not true, uh, by the way, most of the time. So step two would be figure out what the need is. And again, this takes some practice because most people want to blame everybody else. Well, my boss said this. My husband did this. My wife did this. And the world's like this. And it, it doesn't matter. Your, when you understand that your need, you can figure out what your real need is. Step three is to create strategies more than one to get the need met that do not require anyone else to be different. And when you get that, the amount of empowerment and self-assurance and self-confidence goes up because now you don't feel like a sitting duck anymore. You don't feel victimized by the world because you recognize, oh, I have many options to get this need met. Wow, which option do I want? And it doesn't mean people aren't included. Like, let's say you want intimacy and you're in your partner, you say, you know, I would like a little bit more intimacy. Can you help me with that? Right. Of course, you can ask your partner, but you also can't say you can't demand that someone be different in order for you to be happy. That's not how this works. So this exercise is what we start off with. And I, I do it first because if you do nothing else. This will empower you to know that you can, you have the tools and resources to get your need met, to shift how you're feeling, to feel better and to not be a victim to other people or circumstances. 
And then we go to the core wound exercise. And the core wound exercise is going to, it's a seven page exercise about, and it, it takes probably about an hour to do. And someone will go through it. And then you would need one of me or one of my other strategists to help decode it. I mean, it's in the course, so someone could try to do it on their own. But if it's too much for their brain to put together, uh, I try to simplify it as best as I can. I try to be really clear, but I understand my brain and other people's brains do not all work the same. Uh, then you would just pick out this map. We would make this core wound map that now tells you anytime you're upset, here's why. And if you want to heal it, you have to, number one, stop. So let me let me go with invisible. I just had a VIP day with one of my mastermind members on Friday. And we did, the, this is what we did the entire day. Like we didn't do a thing of business because I wanted to get down to the nitty gritty with this stuff because she is in victim mode with her husband and with her work and with her daughter. And I was like, okay, we got to pull it in. <laughs> and even with other people that we know, and one of her core wounds is invisible, feeling invisible. Her dad never acknowledged her. She loved her father and thought he was like the bee's knees. She thought he was great, but he never, it was like children should be seen and not heard. So she didn't have a voice. She didn't. And, and so now when she's with someone who let's say talks over top of her or might look like they're bored when she's talking, it triggers her feeling invisible. And what she does is then withdrawal. So I said, so now, now that instead of blaming other people for cutting you off or not being interested, we have, we have to say, well, what's happened has happened. You can't change what has happened, meaning these things happen, but we can change how you feel about it. The other issue with core wounds is how do we continue feeding it? How do we continue activating the wounds that are in us? So for her, I said, how do you treat yourself as being invisible? And the, and the answer becomes, well, I don't speak up for myself. I don't advocate for myself. I keep my mouth shut. I allow other people to railroad me or whatever. And so then how you start to heal that core wound is to do the opposite, is to advocate for yourself, is to speak up, is to value what you say and to value yourself. So again, I take it thread by thread of what the wound is and then how someone reacts and then try to get them to do the opposite. And at first, that's going to be hard because every system and every neural pathway in your brain wants to protect you and keep you the same. And it goes, no, this feels uncomfortable. No, I don't want to do this. Oh my God, I can't, I'm going to be sick. Right. But it's, you have to push through literally, but when you understand that you're doing it for a reason, you're creating new neural pathways. So now your body can start to relax over time and go, oh, this isn't hard at all. The first time might be really hard and scary. The second time, less hard, less scary. The third time, less hard, less scary. And, and onward until now, it's easy. But we have to push through to create neural pathways so that your physical body has a different reaction. So this can be an unpleasant process for some people, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. You have to feel it to heal it. And, and most people, but that doesn't mean you sit in it. That's the difference. You know, you can go to therapy. And again, for any therapists that are out there listening, I know that there are good therapists out there. I just know a lot of my clients come after five, seven years of therapy and they don't get anywhere. And they're like, oh my God, two sessions in there. And they're just not, they just don't see the path or they keep telling the same story for five years and they're not any different. Um, so can it be uncomfortable? Yeah, but you don't sit in it. And the difference is when you go to, well, it was for me, I'll speak for me. I've been to several therapy sessions with um, an ex-partner and sometimes because of the resistance in the beginning, by the time you get to like the 40 minute mark, like maybe now we're starting to like warm up and maybe get somewhere. And now we've uncovered a problem. Oh, 10 minutes, you got to go. So now you leave feeling worse than when you came in. And that's why I've always preferred coaching over therapy, because that never happens in coaching. Coaching, you come in with a problem. You may have an emotional release within that and, and a discovery, but you always end up leaving feeling more empowered than when you came in. And you'll never have that situation where you feel worse and you're sitting in and you're stewing in it and it brings it up and now you have to carry it home. That's terrible. I hate that. That's why I want to differentiate why this coaching is different than therapy because it's, yeah, it's very different. So can it be uncomfortable? Absolutely. But it is so freeing on the other side and the joy, the amount of joy and love that you start to feel for yourself and allow in is gets more and more the more you do it. So while, yeah, maybe it's like hiking up a mountain. Is it hard? Yeah, but you turn around and say, ah, it's too much, I'm done. Like you push through it because you know it's a beautiful vista at the top of the mountain and you believe you can do it. Emotions won't kill you, okay? If you cry or scream, I promise they won't kill you. And if you're not screaming or crying, 
every quarter, you're emotionally constipated. I imagine you encounter people where uh, they don't want to get better. Is, is that a situation you've, you've run into? I think people are afraid to uncover. I, I have this theory from working with certain people that, yes, they don't because they think looking at it is too painful. So, and, but people will manifest cancer, back pain, um, all kinds of physical manifestations of their toxic negative emotions that will come out in their body. And they're not listening, heart attacks. Um, if you're not taking the cues your body is giving you, your body will give louder messages until it literally puts you on your back or in the ground. Uh, and so I think that the idea of these emotions, if you're not comfortable feeling emotions, if you're not comfortable in, so I took a little trip yesterday. I've been experimenting with some brain enhancing chemicals, let's just say, and um, to sort of dissolve the left brain and the ego and to allow the right brain to be flooded with a different kind of reality. It's like Alice in Wonderland, like I've gone, I went down the rabbit hole. And um, and I, what I kind of concurred after coming out of it was that some people who are attached to their ego, attached to the story, attached to the pain that defines them will be less likely to give that up. Um, so I think that depending on all of our protective layers that we think keep us safe, this is a good point to make. When If you want more love in your life, but you have closed your heart because you think, oh, but I don't want to feel the pain. When you close the door, you don't allow in love either. <laughs> like the door is either open or the door is closed. If the door is open, pain is part of our natural human experience and understanding and flowing through it. What I, what I aim to help people exercise into and master is the ability to allow emotions in and out. You know, in Chinese medicine, each one of our organs represents an emotional center. So your lungs represent grief. So I've worked with many men as a personal trainer over the years who, when they lose a parent, especially their mother, they have bronchitis every time because they have unprocessed grief in their lungs. Uh, liver is anger. So people with back pain, how much anger are they repressing? People that smoke, people that overeat as one of their addictive behaviors to repress emotion. How many of you have back pain? Because you are literally stuffing down the emotion you don't want to feel. You're so afraid of losing control and allowing the emotion out. But I'm here to tell you, it won't kill you. It won't kill you to let it out or feel it, but it will kill you to keep it. You are you are literally like drinking a toxic poison by stuffing it back down because it creates cancer. It creates heart attacks. It creates, you know, people go for multiple surgeries on their back because they think it's a, something wrong with their back. And then seven surgeries later, they still have back pain. Why? Because it's not a physical issue. It's an emotional issue. So when we look at the wisdom of Chinese medicine and that cycle of emotions that we are supposed to be feeling every day, in and out like air, in and out, in and out, calories, in and out, in and out. You wouldn't, no one would think it was healthy to eat, you know, three meals a day for a week and never poop, right? You have to let it out. It comes in, it goes out. Same thing with emotion. It comes in, it goes out. When you hold it's the problem. But I promise you, I've had so many people come to like a live event who's like muscle, They're like, oh, I'm not letting this out. Oh, I'm not going to cry. And then they do and they feel so much better. I'm like, it's not. I want to make a shirt that says, I'm not going to die today. You're not going to die today. Crying will not kill you. I promise. <laughs> In fact, it will it will release a lot of you. And some of you just need a really good cry. Um, but also with intention, like why are you crying? What are you letting out? What are you releasing? It's energy, and it does need to cycle. And some people cry too much. And I, I don't mean too much, meaning like that's their default. That's where they go. Their brain is wired to think everything is going to fall apart. It's you know doom or gloom. They're they're in a different part of their their brain. And for those people, um, I do something called tapping. Most people understand tapping now. It's um, EMF, emotional freedom technique. And it is based on the same meridians as EMDR, eye movement desensitizing reestablishment. EMDR does fingers or pulses, or like if your eyes are open, or you can even do stuff in your hands. It's a neurological trigger to sort of de, de emphasize and, um, and reestablish a new neural connection. So your body, when you get triggered, doesn't go into shock and like your whole body doesn't get flooded. And it's very effective. But tapping is too, and it can be self-administered. I do tapping very differently than the average person. I look at your core wounds first. I make everybody do this core wound exercise. So I tap on the deepest root and that you have a breakthrough so we can dissolve that 
Now it doesn't mean you're completely fixed after one tapping session or two, but it, but now you have the tool. And if I teach you how to use it, you can use it on yourself when you're starting to feel that physical sensation of an emotion that comes up, that makes you feel crazy that you don't know what to do. And all of a sudden you just want to eat it away or drink it away or buy things or be on your computer or, you know, overstimulate yourself with technology, which is what most people do. Now, I know you've changed the lives of many people using these methods, but are you willing to share what hap what's happened to your life? Oh my God. Yeah, of course. Um, yes. So do you want to ask me a more specific question in terms of like one of my core wounds or, or how like, if, techniques if that I It's not getting too personal, JJ. Uh, I'm an open book and my show, like episode 55, 54 on women, men, and relationships. I talk about my divorce. I talk about sacred contracts. I mean, no, I've cried so many times on my show, um, but not like calculated on cue. Just it happens and I let it be. Um, so I, one of my core wounds, and this was, this was life-changing for me. My, I'm a teacher, duh, um, and I love to help people. I did not feel, still don't feel, um, but I'm okay with it now. I've made peace. I'm, I'm very different. I'm very unique. I'm very specialized. Uh, I, I think differently. I see things differently than literally my entire family. Um, my mother, brother, and father, I would say would be possibly younger souls than me. I've been told since I was, I can, I remember that I was an old soul and, and they're never, they're not curious. And that's kind of the defining factor. I've, I've talked to different psychics and people that have done different soul level things. And I, I've always knew I was an old soul, but it's that person who is curious. I know you're very curious. That's what I love about you and how you've taken being a cardiologist and then taking this huge deep dive into the gut, right? Only just because, because you're going to stay in cardiology. You're going to be like, ah, I'm a cardiologist. I'm going to play the game and make a lot of money, you know, but you're curious, you care, you want to learn, you're excited about new information. And that's me too. My parents aren't like that. My parents are very simple people. My brother, I literally think it's his first time on the planet because <laughs> he believes everything he thinks. He believes everything he thinks as to be without asking anybody if it's true. He believes all of his interpretations are exactly the way life is. And it's not. Don't believe anything you think, everybody. OK, so uh, I mean, you can start to believe some of it, but you don't want to believe all of it because it's not true. So I in in saving my marriage or trying to save my marriage and i did this work and i waited on this work it's it's a mago work from harville and helen harville hendrix and i thought oh i need a partner to do this work i literally held it there for as long as i could thinking i want to do this work and it, when i'd ask him do you want to do this work he's like mm, i don't know <laughs> and it wasn't until things got worse and worse and worse that i basically demanded that we do this work and and that's when i regretted not doing it sooner or or doing it individually so when I did this exercise, intellectually, I understood that me trying to teach him wasn't working. I understood that, but I didn't stop doing it because I thought, well, if I just explain it differently, if I just show you in a different way, maybe you'll want to do it or maybe you'll understand or feel better. I was an, I was an ultimate rescuer. Okay. In the, on the victim triangle, we have the rescuer, the victim and the persecutor. And when you're on the triangle, you will be one of each of them at all times. It's getting off the triangle and realizing you're doing it, right? But we all we all get into these roles in our families and in our situations where you're the rescuer or we're the victim or we're the persecutor. And I was being the rescuer, trying to rescue and to teach. Why? Because I wanted someone to be able to reflect me back to me. I wanted someone who could see me for who I am or who I was really get me, really see me on such a deep level. I'm such a, I know you, I don't have to say this, but I'm a very deep and intense person who I have a lot to offer. And I have never really felt anyone know that like I do. In fact, at one point I, I did think I was kind of crazy. I have a healer that I worked with her first session with me and she did not know me. She tapped into me and she said, the first thing that came out of her mouth was, oh my God, you're so smart. And I just busted into tears for like a whole hour. I mean, I cried, ugly cried for like an hour because everything she said was things I would think about myself, but never dare say, because who would I be to say that about myself? And I don't know anyone that would necessarily agree. I'm sure the things I would say would sound arrogant. Who do you think you are to say that? So I never shared a lot of things that I had going on in my head. And then she said all of them. Okay. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. And I, okay. All right, good. We started there. When I did this exercise, this core wound exercise, you, you go through childhood frustrations 
and you list mother, father, and other. So if you weren't raised by your, your mother or your father, let's say a grandmother raised you or an aunt raised you or whatever, somebody else, um, you, you do caregivers basically. And you, you think of situations and then you list how they made you feel and then what you did. And this is the childhood frustrations page on seven page core wound work. And I'm telling you, after I filled it out, that pattern was so clear because my response every time was angry, angry and frustrated. And what I did about it was I yelled and then I taught. So I would get upset. Like I would blame them for not understanding. And then I would try to teach them so they could pull them along because I could create a person who could reflect me back to me and value me like I wanted to be valued. I know my parents love me and they do anything for me. Did they get me? Hell no. <laughs> they don't get me. They don't know what I do. Um, and even when I, you know, even as a personal trainer, they didn't know what I did. I mean, and, and I probably intimidate them in that way. And, and it's, you know, when you, when you're so far out and people don't even want to try because they can't keep up it, will they listen? Yes. But my feeling not valued, not seen and heard, not valued, not, I didn't feel this in, like, I, I know they valued me. It's different. I wasn't, I just didn't feel seen and heard uh, for the way maybe devalued a little bit, but not again, no negative words. I was always encouraged, uh, but they just didn't get me. And when someone doesn't get you and nobody gets you, you feel very alone. It's very lonely to feel like you're the weird one. And I'm the weird one in most places. I'm the one who sees things of all kinds of, and people don't, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know why you care. And, um, right? Which doesn't make anyone want to connect with you. If we all want love and connection, you want to resonate with someone. So they feel and give you love. Like you want, we're all looking for love, but if nobody understands you, then it doesn't feel, it feels lonely. Like no one's going to love you because no one can see you. So if I, if I understand JJ, your core wound was other people's inability or unwillingness to acknowledge, recognize your strengths and your qualities. But how did you go from that, from uh, recognizing, perhaps accepting that core wound to tackling it, to conquering it? Was it just acknowledgement? Well, yeah, the core wound isn't about other people, but it, I would say the core wound is, I'm trying to figure out another way to say it. Maybe it's not not good enough and it's not invisible. I was never, I was paid attention to. And it's not devalued because they didn't not value me, but it wasn't being seen or heard for who I am. I didn't feel, yeah. And then there was a lack of connection. So how did I un, unconsciously actually not even, I didn't even realize it until I did it. So one of the things as a rescuer, most people do is they want to help people not asking. That's what I was doing. I was, I was trying to help my husband who was not asking. And literally when I'd give it to him, he'd say no. <laughs> like, I wasn't even taking the hint. Like when I saw the core wound exercise and I saw the pattern down the page, yell, teach, yell, teach, yell, teach. I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I've been doing this my whole life. I instantly stopped doing it, which is interesting because he would tell me it didn't work. And I'd be like, eh, yeah, 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 I know it doesn't work, but I kept doing it. And all of a sudden I see my pattern from birth and I'll, oh, this is big. And then I just instantly stopped doing it. So, but what I did do was I, again, and this was unconscious, but now, now that I've done it and I can help other people be way more conscious about these choices, I started a podcast. <laughs> like I, I, I mean, I started this podcast and I, I put myself out there when I first started fit to love, it was a seven day a week. I mean, sorry, six day a week program. And it's because I had so much content to want to put out there in different categories, exercise, cooking, nutritional, alternative medicine, relationships, law of attraction, psychology, and that Freedom Friday piece, which is now my spirit, purpose, and energy. It's almost like I had to give myself permission to do that. I had to, I had to, I couldn't just step out into the world as, hey, I'm going to teach you law of attraction. I was like, oh, I didn't earn that yet. I don't know about that. So let me, let me go with what my strengths are, what people expect from me. They expect fitness and nutrition and cooking and alternative medicine, but let me inch these other pieces forward a little bit. And especially my freedom Friday about law of attraction. That was when it was literally, I felt like, cause I'm giving everybody five days a week of what you want. I'm going to take a day for me on what I want. And I honored that by speaking only about the things that I cared about, the passion and excitement I had for law of attraction and psychology and, and you know, intuition and meditation, and all the things that I talked about on that show. 
And what the magic that happened is when I rebranded and put it out as its own show. And I did that first because I had nothing to sell anybody. I'm like, well, okay, I'm just going to put it out there. I really didn't expect anything. And all of a sudden I got like emails. Oh my God, the show is changing my life. Like I was like, wow, there are people that want this. They want what I have. They value me for the things that I value me for. And it became this relationship of, you know, and also a growing because, you know, on YouTube, I know you've heard me say this when I've interviewed on my show, which you're going to be back on my show next year. I say, hey, welcome everybody. And this is my show. And if you don't like me, that's cool. Where can they find more about you? Now I did that because when people are searching on YouTube and they're searching you, you're a very popular person to search. um, They find me and they go, who is this? Shut up. I don't want to hear from you. I want to hear from him. (laughs) And I get it. And I'm not offended by it because they're searching you and they don't want to hear from me. They don't know me. So I just say that at the beginning. So people understand as my show because they don't understand how all this stuff works. And that way I can just cut it, you know, cut to the chase. And if they don't like me, which I'm okay with, they can come find you. I've literally had people say to me, JJ, can you please not talk as much? I said, no, it's my show. (laughs) This is my show. I produce it, pay for it and give it to you for free. Right. But so in terms of valuing, but you have to get to the place where again, it's a constant working through your own value. It in the in the beginning, I definitely would get triggered. I would get triggered by negative comments. And then I but I allowed those triggers to set the tone for the growth I needed. When someone, my biggest fear, my ex used to say this all the time. He'd say, You are out of your league and you don't, you are not qualified to say that. Now I know that when he said that, it was because he knew I was right and he didn't want to admit to it. So that was his his block and his barrier. So of course the first negative comment that came through for me was JJ's not a therapist and it hit me and it hurt. And then I thought about it and I'm like, damn straight. I'm not. And I'm really glad I'm not because most of the things I've seen and heard, you guys aren't very effective. I can get done a lot faster. Even sleep doctor, Michael Bruce came on. He said, you know, as a therapist, it would take me months to get someone to a new level. And I was like, it takes me two sessions. Like this is the difference of the model that you use versus I use. Therapy takes too long, but I had to, I had to appreciate that, acknowledge that and accept that about myself. I accept I am not for everyone, but that self-love path has been worked on through my business, through putting myself out there, through doing my show for even having people recently, someone I met with who I knew we weren't a match and it still, it felt bad for a minute. But then I reflected it back to, if I'm not getting the love I want or the respect I want, it means I'm not loving and respecting myself. So ultimately, this is a path back to you. And you're never done, but it gets easier. And it gets easier to weather it and to see, wow, oh, that kind of hurt a little bit. Why did that hurt? Oh, because you, and then, but again, on the path, it gets less and less and less. And it doesn't mean you still don't cry. It doesn't mean you still don't. I did a whole episode with Dr. Terry Real on inner child work. And every time, well, he's been on three times. Two times he's been on and I'm the ther- and I'm the I'm the therapy. He's therapying me on my show. And we did this whole thing about my mom on inner child work. And I here's you'll appreciate this as someone out in the world. So I we did this show. It's on YouTube. It was before I was saying, if you don't like me, all that kind of stuff, I think. And someone comes on 13 minutes in and they leave a negative comment on YouTube that says, who is this woman? Why is she talking so much? How self-centered is she? If you're, why bother even having a guest if you're going to talk so much? 30 minutes later, oh my God, thank you for being so vulnerable. I really appreciate this conversation. I bought his book. This was life-changing. I really appreciate that you put this out there. So I was like, all right. So, you know, but you have to be able to weather that storm and understand that people's reactions are coming from their own wounds. So, you know, it's a journey. I'm I'm still on it. We're all still on it. But the fun part is when you do it as a community, when you do it as a group, when you have support, when you find the people and attract the people who see you for who you are, when you see you for who you are, I mean, that's, that's the first step. You have to be the one to acknowledge my client on Friday. I said to her, you can't expect someone you're waiting for someone else to tell you you're worthy. That's never going to work. You are like the cell tower emanating your experience out into the world. And you, that's my whole fit to love book. You teach people how to treat you. And if you don't love and respect yourself, you cannot expect anybody else to. It has to start with you loving yourself first. Then from there, you will will be in alignment with other people and you will subconsciously tell them how to treat you. 
because what you'll put up with, what you won't put up with, right? So this this journey, yeah, I love it. This, as you know, I could talk for hours and days on it because I I think it's it is our human experience. It's why we're here. We're here to grow. We're here to expand. We're here to be happy. And anything that blocks that is a lesson. And you get to choose if you want to learn the lesson and be happier, or you're going to stay in your shit and you're just going to twirl around in it and you're going to make excuses and you're going to be afraid. And I understand, yes, it takes courage. It takes courage or for you to be so uncomfortable, so miserable, even on death's door with cancer, radical remission. How many people have to literally change their entire... These things are wake-up calls. They're wake-up calls that your life is not serving you and that your higher being knows there's something better. And if you don't heed the call then we don't know what's going to happen. And it has to be in conjunction with the physical, but the physical is not the last stop. The emotional and mental and spiritual part is literally where it's at, but we all are willing to change our diet. We're all willing to take a supplement. That's easy. That doesn't trigger me in any way. But when I'm asked to change my behavior, when I'm asked to love myself differently, when I'm asked, when I'm, when I'm tell myself that I'm important, therefore I'm going to choose to stay on this program, or I'm going to choose and when I stop stuffing my face to stuff my emotions and I have another way to emotionally process, it gets easier. But many people who do diet programs are battling that they don't want to feel. So they use food to repress their emotions. Thank you, JJ. And every time I talk to you, I learn something new. I always find it very enlightening. You know, I value people and ideas that are novel and unique and sometimes are hard to find. There's a lot of copycats and repetition out there. And so it's just so refreshing to hear novel unique ideas from you and I, and I appreciate that i think you have the same problem i do and that is we have so much material online in the way of books and websites and blogs and podcasts i know you have many 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 podcasts uh where's a good place for someone who's entirely fresh to this material to start with your with the world of jj flazanes my website because it's new and everything's there so we've got two well there are three talks on there that you are welcome to be a part of for free the first one is three reasons why talk therapy is ineffective the second is how emotions uh, create and heal disease okay so anyone that's dealing with that so and they're very very different talks um, my podcast you can find everything at jjfilzanes.com all my social media there are tabs for the for the network i now own the empowering minds network if you're on I, on apple you can type in empowering minds network and you'll see all my shows well, not all of them, but many of them, or go to jjfilzames.com and you can find all the shows. So lots of free stuff. The only thing you can't find is the link I mentioned about the feelings and needs list. That is not public. So that again is jjfilzames.com forward slash feelings list. And it is a free download to, and you can get the instructions and you can start using it today with no other help. My podcast is full of free content, so much content, uh, so much content. And I know it works. I get emails from people that say my show has changed their life and I've never met them. They've never paid me. They've never purchased anything. They literally just, I just give tools. I constantly give tools and I, I t do the next level deep dive for people that have used the tools and are ready for the next level because they can't get there themselves. And so I have all those tools also. That's terrific. Once again, thank you, JJ. Thank you for all your enlightening ideas.